My name is Chloe McKee and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb within HDB. I'm pleased to bring you tonight's webinar on our latest research, requirements and intake of minerals on beef finishing units. Our presenter this evening is Andrew Schofield, a farm vet. Andrew has worked in a mixed veterinary practice in York for 25 years in the farm department. So the plan of action this evening is that Andrew will run through a 30 minute presentation and then there will be time for questions at the end. You'll all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if anyone would like to ask a question, then please type your question into the box on the side of your screen. If you can't see this box, you might need to click the arrow to open this box up. I'll then ask Andrew your questions once he's finished presenting. So hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties tonight, but please bear with us if there are any. So I'll now hand over to Andrew. Well, thank you very much, Chloe, for the introduction. Yeah, as, as, as Chloe said, I was uh, in farm practice in York um, for 25 years. I, I, I run the farm department at the, the Minter Vet Practice. I finished in full-time practice about three years ago uh, and I started, decided to start doing an MSc and, and they, they um, I've done a number of modules at, at um, a variety of different um, uh, colleges including Harper and Cranfield and Nottingham um, and, and this is a, this is my MSc project. Um, the the, the awarding university of the MSc is, is is actually Nottingham, hence hence the Nottingham the University of Nottingham on the on the um, on the uh, slide you'll see. Uh, so um, minerals have interest me not just from a, a clinical aspect, um, but also how decisions are made on factors uh, such as the, the the products people choose, how they're incorporated into rations. Um, but also the market, how how people buy, you know, what what factors mean people will will, will purchase a certain product, and, and and what are the reasons for doing that? And whilst doing the um, my, my MSc, I, I became aware of a, a, of a number of mineral studies. Uh, one was by Liam Sinclair from Harper Adams, who looked at um, 50 dairy herds in Northern England, and um, he looked at the winter housing period. And, and, and found that most of those those herds were feeding um, an excess of minerals and um, 32 of the 50 herds were feeding copper above a UK industry recommended maximum of 20 milligrams per kilogram dry matter um, and I also looked at a study by Nigel Kendall from, from um, Nottingham University who looked at 510 coal cows um, going through an abattoir and 40% uh, of the, the, the dairy cows had a liver copper content above the AHVLA reference range of 8,000. The A AHVLA run the, the local um, the eye centres. Um, so we know from other sectors, particularly dairy, that there's a, a, there appears to be a history of over supplementation, particularly of copper. Um, but information from the, the beef finishing side is lacking and Certainly in, in the latter days when I was in practice, there was uh, a number no, or, or an increasing emphasis on people um, perhaps using um, more bespoke minerals and trying to tailor the minerals they used on farm to actual the requirements of, 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 the, of their farm. So what I want to talk about this evening is uh, a couple of things in particular and one is um, mineral audits and, 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 uh, uh, and how you conduct a, a data mineral audit um, but also the value of slaughterhouse sampling. Whoops, I'm struggling to... So, um, mineral issues. Um, well, everybody, there's, there's a recognition of requirement. Everybody knows that minerals are, are, are a requirement for, for a balanced nutrition. Um, but in, in just going back to this, this history of over supplementation, you know, I think on some farms there's, there's a sort of philosophy that a bit more is better, that if you need to feed maybe 30 or 40 grams per head per day, why not 60 grams? Um, and another difficulty is the, the uh, interactions or an, an, an antagonisms and trying to estimate that effect. So people will probably be aware that it, with, with a mineral such as copper, you get issues from um, uh, molybdenum and sulfur, but also issues from, from uh, iron and sulfur. And that can tie up copper and 
people generally know that if they 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 there might be a sort of um, a high level of copper in their borehole water, and perhaps we should be giving a bit more mineral. But sort of trying to quantify that effect is is very difficult. And uh, there's also an X factor. People associate um, a particular. Uh, mineral might have a, a, a really beneficial effect on their farm. Um, I think at the moment um, there appears to be a, a bit of a fad for increasing uh, the cobalt content in diets, and, and, and people tend to be going with with, with high co high cobalt rations. I'm not quite sure how much science there is behind that, but it, it definitely seems to be a factor. Um, a further issue is that when you do have a deficiency, the signs can be vague and, and, and so and, and they can be common to a number of, of, of different minerals. So with both minerals such as copper and cobalt, you might get signs of ill thrift or weight loss or anemia. But those signs can be caused by other other diseases such as such as parasitic in, in, in um, problems. So diagnosis of, of deficiencies can be can be difficult. Um, Beef cattle require at least 17 different minerals for normal maintenance, growth and production. And we divide those minerals, or, or in the project, we yeah, the minerals are divided into macro minerals. Uh, macro minerals, the, the requirement is, is usually in terms of grams per day. And, and, and the project, we looked at the macro minerals in the diet of calcium, phosphorus, uh, magnesium, sodium, potassium and sulfur. Um, but also micro minerals, and, and, and in the project we looked at the, 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 the micro minerals such as uh, copper, selenium, manganese, cobalt, zinc, and iron. And uh, we looked at molybdenum. Molybdenum, there's no requirement for molybdenum, but molybdenum, as I've just mentioned, does does have an effect on on or an antagonism with 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 copper in particular. Micro minerals, people will just use the term trace elements. So. In the talk this evening, I might use the term microminerals, I might use the term trace elements, but it's, 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 the, it's the same thing. <clears throat> and the, the aims of the project um, was really to assess if there was any evidence of um, over supplementation or under supplementation in finishing herds. Um, was there a difference um, in mineral status between cattle finished indoor and those finished at pasture? but also to assess the usefulness of samples collected at, at, at slaughter. So there were three aims with the, with the project when I, when, I, when I set off. You, you're probably all aware that the feed management phases are divided into three periods. We look at rearing, uh, growing, uh, and finishing. Uh, these aren't necessarily absolutely discrete periods. They tend to merge into one another. And, and, and certainly between growing and finishing, you'll tend to sort of phase in one ration and, and, and uh, phase out one ration and phase in another to avoid uh, issues with um, conditions such as acidosis. Um, and it's obviously better for rumen health if you can if you can avoid abrupt diet changes. So the finishing period, um, if you look at your um, BRP manuals, is described as a, a short, sharp period um, which maximises uh, meat yield and optimises fat cover. Um, and the, the, the project was entirely related to, to the finishing period. So the way the, 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 the project was, uh, the, was set up was that we uh, selected um, 14 farms, seven of which um, were finishing uh, cattle uh, indoors and seven of which were feeding um, um, uh, cattle at, uh, finishing cattle at pasture. Each farm was visited and uh, samples of feed taken for analysis. We didn't analyze, analyze everything, and I'll, I'll explain later on um, what, what required analysis and, and, what, and what didn't. Um, uh, we followed up the farm visit by, or I followed up the farm visit by, by doing slaughterhouse sampling, and I collected blood and liver samples at slaughter from six animals from each farm. Um, they weren't necessarily all collected in, 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 in one batch. Sometimes we collected um, animals or maybe a couple of animals on three occasions or, or, or perhaps three animals and one week and three animals next week. That was just purely related to how animals were submitted for slaughter from, from the farm's concern. And then both the feed samples and the slaughterhouse samples were submitted to 
um, Nuvetna Laboratory, which is the laboratory at uh, Nottingham Vet School um, for, for, for analysis. Um, the, later on in the, in the talk, you'll see a number of categories used on, on results. And those are categories employed by Nuvetna. And, and, and so we will categorize results in terms of um, deficient, marginal, um, normal and above normal. So when I talk about samples being deficient, that's actually a category employed by, by uh, Nuvetna. Um, BARMs were, were, were recruited um, on the basis of supplying particular slaughterhouses, uh, in, in, in total four slaughterhouses were used. Um, we uh, recruited farmers from the Pasture Fed Beef Association. Uh, we used two AHDB project farms and there are also some farms that were known to me from previous clients. Mm. Following up the, the, the farm, farm visits and the, and the slaughterhouse sampling, um, a, each farm received a written report outlining um, the results from, from their particular farm and any recommendations. So the indoor finishers, um, ranged in size from those finishing 75 to farms finishing 850 um, and there was some division as well in in, in 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 terms of ration that three of the indoor finishes were uh, intensive cereal which is quite a common system of finishing cattle in the Vale of York which is a, a, a sort of quite a large arable area as well um, and on every farm the feed was mineralized by a complementary feed or mineral blend being mixed with a ration. Mm. The pasture finishers, um, they were, um, tend to be a bit more far flung from York, which was just related to the systems of, of, of finishing in the area. Um, the farms were a bit smaller, um, and also the, the, the means of, of, of supplementation of minerals varied as well. So two of the um, pasture finishers uh, provided minerals by feeding a compound at, at, at pasture. Um, two fed a um, mixed minerals with homegrown cereals um, a, a, in, a, in a, a blend. Um, one provided minerals um, through three access via a trough and two farms provided uh, no mineral provision at all. <clears throat> Um, I described before about the finishing period divided into three phases, and that they, we, we expected this that the finishing uh, period to be um, a short, sharp period. And probably in reality, it's a bit a bit longer than than than, than, um, than realised. So for on the indoor farms, the finishing period varied from from one to ten months, and uh, at pasture. The finishing period varied from from three weeks to seven months. So we we, we it was quite actually um, was, the farmers we selected and, and whether this is uh, typical or not it's, it's perhaps open to debate. But the finishing period is perhaps a bit longer than than, than we realise. And the farm's history. Um, Nine of the 14 farms had a history of um, trace element um, uh, issues in the past. Um, some of these were historic and may have occurred, you know, 10, 15 years previously. Um, and we diagnosed or we, 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 we described a, a, a trace element uh, issue as being the result of a soil or a forage analysis indicating um, a very low level of a particular uh, mineral, or that they there have been clinical issues and I work up by a vet. And um, on one farm, we um, used a response to to uh, an increase in copper in the diet as as, as, a, as a means of of describing a a a trace element issue. It's not particularly scientific, but I think that does happen. That a farm a farmer considered he had a, an issue with a particular field. Um, and he was visited by a, a rep, and the rep said, I think there's a molybdenum issue, they increased the copper and, and, and saw a response. But I've included that in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the project. 
None of the farms, none of the 14 farms considered that they had current clinical issues with, um, uh, with minerals. Um, but some farms considered they had a suboptimal performance and then that was normally that they weren't meeting um, target growth rates in terms of daily live weight gain. And I think on some of those farms, the possibility of a, a mineral issue was at the back of people's people's minds. They did they did wonder whether there was a a you know could could minerals be at the at the, at the bottom of this or not. Um, five of the farms had organic status, and I think they were all on the on the pasture pasture farms. So this is uh, one of the farms visited. This is where the um, this is the actually the the uh, at Harper Adams. Um, this was the, uh, an AHDB project um, run by Simon Marsh, who was finishing um, black and white steers and Hereford cross steers off grass. So, each, as I say, each farm was visited. Uh, an initial questionnaire was, was completed, which would examine the, the system of feeding and the ration formulation, whether that was carried on by the, the farmer or a nutritionist. Um, targets were discussed in terms of age at slaughter or daily, daily live weight gain and, and where these met, previous mineral issues um, and also any, any, any clin clinical issues in terms of respiratory disease. Um, and then the stock were examined um, and, and samples collected. So here we, 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 the, the cattle were all grazing on, on, on paddocks and rotated around, samples of grass were collected. I think this was a mains water supply. So on farms feeding uh, where they were using mains water, we, we, we relied on information from the local water companies for mineral analysis. We didn't do uh, samples on those. Um, and also they were feeding it as, as they approached slaughter, they were, feed, they were fed a compound. So what is a, a mineral audit and, and, and how do you go about conducting one on, on, on your farm? So. A mineral audit is a, it's a useful um, um, uh, project um, and it's just really an estimation of daily mineral intake. Uh, it includes minerals to include in the feed and water, but it also includes mineral sources such as boluses, drenches uh, and injectables. <clears throat> Initially, it requires a, a knowledge of, of dry matter intake uh, or an estimation of dry matter intake, uh, the knowledge of the mineral content of individual feeds and water. Um, it requires some analysis of feeds. So the feeds that were not analysed for the with the project where where a, a a feed was entirely homegrown. So uh, if a if a farm was feeding grass silage was entirely homegrown, that would be analysed. If the cereals were uh, all homegrown, they would be analysed. Um, if the um, cereals were being being sourced from a number of different number of different um, farms, they, they, they we would use a, a what called a, a, a book value. Um, we did analysis of water only on farms that were feeding a, from a from a borehole supply. Um, there was also some estimates so for um, intensive cereal farms um, that were um, feeding that would be feeding uh, straw uh, either ad, uh, you know regularly bedded on, 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 on in straw pens or in racks we, we, we estimated that the drilling, uh, the straw was providing 12 percent of the dry matter intake so it's not a precise science, and, it, and, and there's some estimates, but it is, it is, a, it is a very valuable technique it's just to just to periodically check what you what's what's going on on, on your farm. Um, for compound feeds, we and, and, and mineral blends, we used uh, information that is um, was on what was on feed labels. So, um, if you look at your feed label, there will be um, you'll you'll see. Um, two values. You see an analytical constituent, and the, the, this is the uh, analysis of the feed as a whole. Um, there is a, uh, a mandatory requirement for certain macro minerals that the you the, the um, that the analysis is 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 uh, provided on the, on the on the feed, and 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 
the macro minerals here are calcium, magnesium, sodium, and phosphorus. Um, and the magnesium and phosphorus levels are both zero, but that's that's a, which is, I suppose, not uncommon with, with, with finishing cattle and people trying to avoid um, uh, stones and the uh, urine calculi. So, but there's there's, there's a mandatory analysis uh, on on the, on the product as a whole, and then you'll you you will come down and you'll see um, the, the additives, and these are the, the um, you normally the trace elements, um, also the vitamins that are added to the product. Um, these are usually given, or they will will, will not all now be given in in terms of um, the elemental form. So you want to know how much um, copper is in a product. You don't want to know how much um, copper pentahydrates in a, in a product. So the requirement now is that the, the additives are given um, in an elemental form. You may still see some um, old labels on, 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 on product that maybe maybe um, maybe been around for a little while, which will contain uh, trace elements in in a compound form, um, and and which which require a bit of sort of maths to calculate how much how much is actually of the element you're feeding. There's there's a period of grace being allowed from from companies to change over from providing information. Uh, on compound to to, to uh, information on in uh, an elemental form, um, the it's unlikely uh, or it's it, it's it's difficult that you will be given a precise analysis. Uh, I think there's a there's, there's there's a degree of um, some degree of secrecy about about the if you like for for, for want of a better term the recipe, and so the absolute complete uh, analysis in terms of Every mineral that's in that product, it's unlikely that you'll be you, you'll be provided with that, even if you uh, contact the the, you, the 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 mill the mill concerned. I know um, we had a couple of farms on the project where we were trying to get sort of a, a, a detailed analysis, and the, the best we were getting was was the um, was just the, the, the information that was provided on the on the feed label. Now that's that's fine for most. Um, Minerals, and as, as I said, you, you, we are really, you know, we're looking at trying, to, you know, at best probably an estimate of, 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 of a mineral audit. It does have limitations for some minerals, such as sulfur, where we might be worried about um, issues with antagonism with copper and trying to get sort of a precise results on, on, on sulfur content um, can, can be difficult. So you can get information from from other sources, as a, uh, and um, with water, the only farms we did analysis on was were the farms using a borehole. If you go on to your local um, water board or local water company uh, and look at water quality reports, which are available online, uh, you will get a water quality report for your postcode or or the the village or the zone you are in. And that provides enough information or provides enough detail for you to um, uh, do a mineral audit. It won't be, it won't be, um, you won't have a complete range of minerals, but you'll probably get the important minerals such as calcium and uh, and, and, and and sodium and copper, uh, and that's and that's adequate for the for the terms of of, of an audit. Um, and I mentioned other sorts of information, so. Um, for some feeds, we used a book value, and um, a book value just simply means you, you you open the book and you go to the to the charts in the back, and you 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 use a, a, the, the a mineral content from from there. There's a couple of books I would um, I would I would recommend. One's Animal Nutrition, and uh, if you if you've got a, a real bent for um, for nutrition in, in uh, beef cattle, and you can you can use the there's a, a, a large term called the nutrient requirement of beef cattle, and that uh, really does uh, provide a lot, an awful lot of detail. And we used book values where farms were were purchasing normally straight potatoes, um, perhaps barley, perhaps wheat from several sources. We didn't want to do analysis on on maybe four or five different. Uh, feeds and we and we used a book value as uh, probably as a means of convenience but also you know we didn't want the cost to to to, to escalate and um, the in terms of the the collection of of, of um, 
uh, forage and, and grass, then the, the, the protocols are on the, on the AHDB website in, in the report that's, been, that's already been uh, submitted. So mineral law has some limitations that it's, you, you, it, it's a snapshot. We, there will be some uh, seasonal factors. Um, we know that the um, that the that there'll be some variation in, in in the related to to grass growth in in terms of um, the balance between uh, vegetative growth and, and and reproductive growth and, and how that affects mineral contents in in terms of of um, calcium or uh, phosphorus or, or or potassium. Those those are often recognised changes, and, and and we can we can account for some of these the, these factors. There's also a variation um, between pastures and, and from year to year. So uh, again, particularly with macro minerals, you might find that there's variation between pastures on one farm and that the um, effects from, from one year to, to the next, there can, be, there can be reasonable differences. Those variations tend to be more uniform with trace elements and it does tend to be mainly a, 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 an issue with, with, with macro minerals. We've got a, a, an issue with estimating dry matter intakes. Um, on the farms, we, we looked at dry matter intakes varied from, from 1.9 to 2.5 percent, and uh, and and we, we we know that some of those were probably a degree of overestimation, um, because on farms where we could actually measure dry matter intakes um, quite accurately because they were feeding uh, using using feeders and with, with, with weigh scales and we knew the dramatic contents of forages there was a degree of overestimation of dramatic intakes that's perhaps not too too important with um, a, a, a TMR type ration because we're, we're often looking at a, a mineral concentration in terms of milligram per kilogram dry matter dry matter intakes are certainly an issue uh, or estimated dry matter intakes are an issue with with, with cattle at pasture that may be feeding a compound um, because of the effects of substitution. Um, and uh, so it, 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 is, it isn't easy with cattle at pasture, and, and, um, but there will, be some, there will be some inaccuracies because of this, the, the, the effect of dry matter intakes. We've also got issues of, of selective grazing um, and, and free access minerals. We know that with, with, with free access minerals um, that some, some animals will take far more than the required uh, and others not enough. So the free access minerals are, are very convenient, but they're not a particularly efficient way of feeding minerals. And we'll, we'll go back to this issue again of, of bioavailability. You know, what are, what are the interactions between some minerals and also what are the, um, you know, what are the antagonisms that, that, that may be going on? And I mentioned at the start that we followed up the, um, the, the farm visit by doing uh, slaughterhouse sampling. So we um, took liver and blood samples from six cattle from each project farm. That was divided into 26 heifers, um, 42 steers and 16 bulls. Um, and this was, uh, I think, a, 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 is a particularly useful technique. You don't need a lot of, of material. We only had to collect two um, tubes of blood from each animal. Um, and, and we required 20 grams of liver, which is basically the size of your thumb. So we didn't, we didn't need an awful lot of, of, of um, material. Producers already receive information from the abattoir in terms of um, carcass weight and conformation and fatness. But I really think that information taken from, from, from uh, abattoir samples can complement the information that producers already receive. Um, I was, was responsible for collecting all the samples. I actually think, um, in, in hindsight, many of those samples could be collected by um, abattoir staff, um, technical staff within the abattoirs. I think that would probably work slightly better. There's understandable issues with abattoirs in terms of who, who they let in, uh, you know, who, who's getting access, uh, and, and even for a vet, just, just gaining access can be time consuming. And the samples, as I say, are, are straightforward to collect. And it may well be the case that those can be, um, you know, done perhaps a bit more, more efficiently by, by, um, by um, abattoir staff. So just, sorry, just going back to, the, to this slide, the, the, the liver samples were 
the liver tissue samples we we, we looked at for um, copper, cobalt, selenium, and manganese contents, uh, and the blood for a range of indices reflecting uh, copper, selenium, cobalt, zinc um, um, indices. So we for for some minerals we looked at a range of indices um, that may reflect. Um, their mineral intakes over a period of time. So for a mineral such as copper, yeah, yeah. Um, liver copper content reflects intakes over a period of weeks and months, um, whereas um, plasma copper might reflect intake of you know, very recent intake. So we looked at not just one sample per mineral, we looked at a range of, of, of different indices. And the results, the project results. Um, so mineral supplementation is a requirement on, on all farms that you, you your, your basal ration will not provide the minerals um, that the, 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 the finishing cattle require, and that's a, I suppose of interest because we had we had two farmers that were that were providing no minerals. Um, grass met the macro mineral requirements in grazing finishes, um, but was we, 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 we have high you know we, we we saw high potassium levels there. I think the, I think the mean potassium level with the cattle finished at grass was 2.52 percent um which potassium um does have an effect on on on, on the um absorption of magnesium now that might not be a, an issue with with finishing cattle but it's certainly an issue with your if that land is being um used by sucklers and in, in, in terms of the risk of staggers um iodine and copper were fed at a level below requirement on four of the seven um pasture finishing farms whereas with indoor finishing with indoor finishes copper selenium cobalt and iodine were all fed um, at a level above requirement uh, so for uh, cobalt uh, on indoor finishing farms the mean uh, intake was 130 percent um, in excess of requirement and that included one farm feeding cobalt um, in excess of 340 um, percent in contrast um, six of the seven um, yeah, pasture farms feeding cobalt uh, were actually below requirement, and, and, and the mean intake of cobalt was, was 40% below requirement. So the general picture was of a um, pasture farms where we were seeing um, mineral farms uh, where we were seeing trace elements being fed below requirement, and pasture and, and, and indoor finishes where we saw um, trace elements in particular being fed at a level well above requirement. In terms of liver coppers, this 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 is also reflected in in in, in some of the tissue samples. Um, so for liver coppers, 43% uh, of the liver coppers from indoor cattle were classed as a being above normal, whereas in pasture finished animals, 19% of the liver coppers were deficient. And for liver seleniums, uh, with cattle finished indoors, 29% were classed as marginal, but 88% of um, liver selenium contents from pasture finished animals were classed as marginal or deficient and I, I thought I'd just outline one farm which is farm 12 the 12 just refers to the to the order the farm was, was visited so this is the 12th farm I looked at which was a um, pasture finisher and we looked at, a, at this was a farm which which had some trace trace element um, issues in the past in terms of selenium but copper was never recognized as being a problem on this farm and we looked at uh, of this of the six coppers on this farm the the uh, the category used in the vetna is that uh, deficient is regarded as being less than 281 so all the samples were deficient um, the normal range for copper for, for is 1405 to 5619 so you can see that these liver coppers were all, you know, all well below the, the, the normal range. Um, it wasn't a farm that, that, that thought he had um, a liver copper issue, um, but, they, but it certainly became apparent when, when we took the samples. And I don't think often with, with, um, with a lot of minerals that you get a, a black and white effect that you sort of say, right, well, we're feeding um, copper below requirements and there's an issue here. 
and, and, and we're bound to see, you were guaranteed to see clinical signs, you know, with, with this level of, 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 of copper that you might start seeing, you know, coat changes and spectacles around the eyes. I think you start seeing sort of vague signs before that. And I'm sure that this farm will have had some issues, perhaps in terms of the cattle not quite being 100% or in terms of effects on the immune status. Um, but but, it, but it, it certainly became apparent when, when, we, when we took the samples. This, this farm, um, you would have picked up issues on this farm had you just done a mineral audit alone because the, the dietary copper, um, he was feeding a level of 6.3 milligrams per kilogram body weight and the requirement for, for, for copper, the NRC requirement is 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight. But at the same time that he's feeding a low copper level, it, there was a high level of, of antagonists in the diet. So the dietary iron was, was 220 versus um, 220 milligrams per kilogram body weight versus requirement of 50. And the dietary sulfur was, was, was probably, was roughly um, twice what, what the, the, the level of requirement was. So even without doing abattoir samples, you would have picked up an issue with, with um, just doing a mineral, a mineral audit. And the take home message, well, I think it's, it's sensible, um, even if you don't think you've got an issue, to do both mineral audits and, and, and periodically just look at the level of minerals uh, in the ration. Um, if you want to take that one step further to think about doing slaughterhouse samples, which I think are really useful and um, and, and, and probably not as complicated as, 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 as people think, and then develop a, a strategy according to the results of, of, of both slaughterhouse sampling and um, uh, mineral feed mineral audits about you know what level of input you require because just going back to the project you know some inputs were hundreds of percent above requirement and that's that's just a, a, a waste really so a few thanks and acknowledgements um nigel kendall and, and andrea clarkson from the, from the university of nottingham ahdb who who funded the lab work um associated with the project and uh, the slaughterhouses involved in the project, ABP, uh, Dumbaya and, and, and Dovecote Park. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Um, while I'm waiting for some questions to come up, I'd just like to remind everyone that the presentation has been recorded. So in the next couple of days, it will be on the HTB Beef and Lamb YouTube channel. Um, so we've got one question already. Um, is liver copper a measure of copper found in the liver at slaughter? Uh, yes, yeah, we we um, just as a, we went in and we took some some um, copper samples. So yes, liver copper is the is the is the content the the copper content of the liver. Thank you. Um, and somebody's just asked, could you go back to the slide on what is required for a mineral audit, please? Yeah. And taking that further, Andrew, I just wondered, so when, when somebody mm. gets the um, the value for, for their feed and their water contents, what do they actually do with those numbers? So for each mineral, would they add them together from the water and the feed or? Yeah, it's, it's you you determine the dry matter, initially you determine the dry matter intake, and then you want to know what's the, um, of the, of, of the you know, so let's assume a farmer's perhaps feeding uh, grass silage and a cereal. You know what proportion of that dry matter intake is accounted for by grass silage, and what proportion is accounted for by a cereal. You know the um, from from either tests or from from um, a book value. You can then calculate the mineral content from the grass silage and the min mineral content from the cereal. You then make an estimate of the um, the amount of mineral that's provided by water and for the um, project we we used an estimate that um, for each kilo of dry matter intake there will be 5.4 kilos of uh, water consumed and um, now uh, that's put again a, an estimate if you look at um, uh, studies then there's, there, there, there's often quite a wide variation of water intake in, in um, in, in finishing cattle. 
um, but it's it, it, it's 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 the published uh, value. And so, knowing the um, mineral content of the feed and the mineral content of the water, you then add those together, and uh, you can you can calculate total mineral mineral input. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I've got here. Do different breeds of cattle have different requirements, like some sheep breeds do? Uh, yeah, there is probably there's probably a, a, some breed effect. Um, I mean, there's obviously very recognised um, breed effects in sheep in terms of copper. I don't think it probably exists to the to the same um, extent in cattle, but there is there is probably some um, breed effects in in, in cattle. Thank you. Um, and could you just recap what diet Farm 12 was on, please? Uh, so Farm 12 was a uh, it was a pasture farm uh, who turned out uh, cattle. Um, he, he, he'll turned out cattle probably in April. Uh, the cattle will have gone for slaughter in October. Um, he will have started. He was on the so he, the cattle were on uh, grass all summer. And I think about July, he started feeding a compound feed. So he, he was feeding a compound nut. That will have started from memory, uh, probably one and a half kilos a day. I think he was increasing the, uh, and that was increased incrementally in probably half kilo tranches uh, every sort of two or three weeks. So by the time the cattle were going for slaughter, um, I think he was probably feeding about three kilos of, of, of compound uh, per head per day. So it was it was a, a um, yes, it was a compound, a compound nut and grass. Thank you. Um, we've got a question here. What is the best way to supplement cattle at grass? Um, well, I, I, having, um, you know, I, I'll go back to, to the final slide in terms of um, it, it, it'd be useful to know, um, you know, decide on, on, on some sort of strategy in, in, in terms of whether you have any issues or any, any deficiencies on the farm. I think if you want to tailor your requirements as closely as possible, then uh, you, you probably use something like a bolus. Uh, I think there are times where uh, free access minerals is obviously very convenient and very straightforward and very easy. But um, and there probably are times where you you um, you're obliged to use free access minerals. But it, it, as I say, it's, it is it is not a particularly efficient way of of of, um, of feeding uh, minerals. So a bolus, um, a number of the um, farms on the project were feeding uh, either a compound nut or feeding a homegrown cereal with a mineral blend mixed in but again it's a case of just trying to recognize what your requirements are in terms of selecting what mineral you use or what blend you use or the level of minerals within a particular compound. Thank you. Um, so you've mentioned over supplementation issues and obviously there's a cost associated there. Um, is it Does it have a detrimental effect to cattle health and is there any impacts on the environment? Um, well, certainly, certainly, um, if, you, if if the level of supplementation is high enough, then then there you, you you can get toxicities. You can get um, so liver copper or, or, or copper poisonings are um, you know are recorded every year in the, in, in the UK, and, and I think those are often associated where people are feeding copper maybe by a number of different routes that they're perhaps feeding uh, perhaps a, 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 um, a compound and then they may be using a blend um, and, and perhaps not realizing the cumulative effect of how much how much mineral that they are feeding um, so you, you, you can certainly you know the, the worst case scenario is that you kill something yeah and, and, and that, 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 that does happen unfortunately not very commonly but it, it, it cases are recorded every year you can also get an effect on the on the environment um, you know if we're particularly with, with, with minerals such as phosphorus um, and so there are there are some you know environmental issues as as, as well. Thank you. Um, so Farm Twelve with the copper deficiency before the study, if they had done a soil sample, could this have been recognised earlier? Um, we didn't do. We discussed at the start of the project. Um, we discussed um, what samples we should take and. Um, we discussed, we decided 
just to go with um, doing uh, dietary mineral audits and slaughterhouse samplings. We discussed soil sampling. Um, soil sampling uh, does have some uses. So the, 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 the main um, effect for a range of minerals uh, in terms of the concentration uh, in herbage is the level in soil. But um, you, there, there are a host of factors um, which influence the the um, the uptake of minerals by herbage from soil, including you know the degree of waterlogging, um, the organic status, the redox potential of soil, pH, um, and we didn't do any 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 soil sampling. So it, it's it's it adds another level of um, difficulty in terms of interpretation. Um, whether this farm would have had a very low level of copper in the soil, um, I, I suspect he probably would, but um, we, we, it's not something we looked at. And as I say, I think if I was advising farmers what samples to take, I would probably just start look at doing a mineral audit in terms of feed. Um, I think slaughterhouse samples are useful. Um, you could think about soil sampling, but it's some, certainly something I would, you know, I would put at the bottom of my list in, um, as opposed to taking as opposed to taking the other samples. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we've got another question here. How did the magnesium status appear on the various groups of cattle? Uh, magnesium was was I think was um, we was um, we looked at magnesium in, 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 in the feed. Um, we found no evidence of um, any issues of magnesium being fed at a level um, below requirement. And the, the, the main concern with uh, magnesium is the, is the high levels of uh, potassium in the, in the, um, in the, it we found in the diet. So I think um, there was only one of the pasture farms where the level of potassium in the diet was below 2%. And, and and so our, our concern was um, the effect that um, high potassium might have a magnesium um, but the 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 level of, of magnesium um, on, on all farms to say was 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 um, you know there was, there was no farm that was feeding magnesium below below requirement thank you um, and how comparable is liver copper to that the copper result found from a blood test on a living animal? Um, well, the, there's, there's a number of tests you can, you can, you can, um, you can do to assess the copper status of an animal. Um, and the gold standard is to do liver copper. Um, the issue of um, um, blood coppers, um, so a series of, of low plasma coppers might provide you with some information that there's the, the, the um, level of um, copper in the diet is inadequate. Um, having said that, you can get normal plasma copper levels, normal blood levels, whilst copper is accumulating in the liver. And then you can get sort of a, a sudden release of, of, of copper from the liver. Uh, and which which can cause issues. So um, there are other issues. The other um, factors or the other the other indices we, we we looked at with copper is that we looked at um, we looked at liver coppers. We looked at um, the seroplasmin level, which is a copper containing enzyme in the blood. We looked at a ratio called the seroplasmin to plasma copper ratio, which is an indicator of the level of um, um, antagonism from molybdenum. So um, what, what actually happens uh, is in, in the gut is you, um, molybdenum can um, bind or can react with sulfur to form a category of products called thiamolybdates. Um, and thiamolybdates can tie up copper in the gut and, and stop its absorption. Um, so um, you can assess the level of um, impact from thiamolybdates by looking at the seroplasmin plasma copper ratio. 
Um, so that's that's one area we looked at to, to assess the level of, of, of fire and lib dates. Um, generally, we found that the effect from fire and lib dates um, wasn't great. The, the 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 farms where we 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 saw most fire and lib date issues was the intensive cereal farms. Uh, so it does appear to be an effect from pH as well. Intensive cereal farms are feeding at that that's high in high in starch, and they're going to get relatively acidotic rumens, and they appear, this appeared to have some effect on the, um, the the interaction between copper and thiamine thio lib dates. And we also looked in terms of copper. We also looked at um, a copper containing enzyme um, in the uh, in red blood cells. Um, so if we know the lifespan of red blood cells and the level of the enzyme in red blood cells, um, it gives us some indication of copper status over a six to eight week period. And then, so we looked at we looked at something called superoxide dismutase levels in, in, in erythrocytes in red blood cells. Um, but uh, so there's a, there's a range of um, different indices we looked to to to, to, um, to examine the copper status. Um, so, uh, and, and, but just doing a plasma copper alone it gives you some information, but the, you know you can get far more by by looking at at, um, at other factors as well. Thank you, Andrew. Um, how often should borehole water be analysed on farm? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I. I suspect you're probably not going to get the variation that you do with forage in terms of um you know major changes perhaps on a on, a, on an annual basis but i i would perhaps think about looking at at, at um um borehole and you know i don't i certainly don't think you need to do it annually but perhaps every every, every three or four years i think would, would be adequate but um yeah, I'd have to I'd have to check on that. I'm not sure, but I I, I think sort of every three or four years would, would, would probably be a sensible protocol. Thank you. Um, and the final question, if we don't get any more in the next minute or so, is the farms that were finishing on pasture were they all on a similar grass lay, and would different lays have had a different um, impact in on the study on the results? Do you think? Um, they were probably relatively similar. They were they were, they were um, widely spread. So um, where I'm based or where I was working in the Vale of York, there's a lot of uh, indoor in, uh, um, finishing cattle and there's a lot of uh, in, in, intensive systems, um, but there's far fewer systems finishing grass. So uh, I think I did one pasture farm in Northumberland, one in County Durham. Um, I found two uh, in this area, I did two, well, I think three in this area, and I did two in Shropshire. So there's a there's a big um, spread geographically, and um, they were probably all on some form of permanent pasture. I don't think any was was with new sown lay, um, but again, you will probably get some effect from from the species of grass on on the um, on the pasture. But I couldn't, you know, probably you know go beyond that really. Thank you. Um, so we've just had a few more questions pop up. So um, if the borehole water supply is very high in iron, does it do any harm and what can we do about it? Um, well, it, it does do harm because because um, you, iron is um, an antagonist. Um, as I mentioned during the talk that um, you get interactions with copper from iron and sulphur, but also from um, lignum and sulphur. So if the borehole water was very high in iron, you would want to know what the level of um, iron was in the, in, the, in the diet. You'd want to know what the level of molybdenum was in the diet. Uh, and you'd probably want to know what the level of sulfur was in the diet and also the level of copper. Um, and decide you know, how strong the effect from the, uh, of antagonism was. I mean, if, if, the, if the level of iron um, was sufficient, you would probably want to increase the, 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 the copper content of the diet. But certainly you want to look at the other the, the level of other antagonists in the diet. Um, and if you can get some some samples from the abattoir in terms of, of, of copper, that makes the um, uh, the decision on, on, on the level of supplementation easier. So one difficulty 
um, when we start talking about antagonists is actually knowing precisely how they're going to, you know, if, if the level of um, iron in the diet is X and the level of molybdenum is Y, then how much copper should we be feeding? And it's, that's quite difficult, knowing the, 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 the level of interaction. And it's, again, useful. This is useful where slaughterhouse samples come in. That it, it makes this sort of the decision-making process in terms of how much copper you put in the diet easier because you're, you're getting some information about how much copper is avoiding that antagonism and, and, and um, accumulating in the liver. So, yes, if you've got high IN, you'd want to look at the other antagonists, but also the, the, the copper content as well. Thank you. Um, and we've just got another one. Some companies do mineral mixes, which you can apply straight to grass. Are these a good way of getting the correct minerals to, into the animals? Um, well, it's, it, it, I guess if, if they apply, I, I, I presume this is, this is pasture grass and that they are, yeah. they are then you, you get the issues where those minerals will go down into the soil, they will, you know, and I guess the, the, the issue then is, you know, how much of those minerals are taken up from the soil into herbage and we've got these factors that influence that in terms of um, and pH and the degree of water logging and organic status and redox potential. So it's, 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 um, it would be something that would be very difficult to forecast how much is actually going to finish up in the animal. Um, and, um, and I would, I would probably look at other things before I, before I, um, I did that, I think. Thank you. Um, was there any correlation between mineral status and the incidence of disease or underperformance? Um, most of the farms we saw um, had um, health, the health status was, was, was pretty good. Um, we had one of the uh, intensive cereal farms um, where we had a very high level of respiratory disease and um, a significant level of mortality. And that was also one of the farms where we saw thyroid lib date issues. Um, so it's very difficult to tie in um, issues of thyroid lib date with, with the, um, there are so many factors involved with um, uh, the, the sort of respiratory disease and the, and the causes of respiratory disease um, in cattle in terms of everyone uh, is aware of sort of. Um, you know, where the, where the cattle are coming from, the immune status, the housing, the ventilation. Um, but it was certainly a farm where we saw thyroid lib date issues. Um, every farm received a report and, they, that, they, and, that, and, and that will have been highlighted on the report. And it'd be interesting to go back, that they, you know, if we can correct um, any, any problem or any, any, any challenge with thyroid lib date, whether that affects the um, the level of pneumonia on the farm or level of respiratory disease on the farm, but trying to say that the pneumonia was definitely an issue related to mineral status is, isn't isn't something that you could um, isn't something you could you could you could state really. Thank you. Um, so we've just got two questions left, and then we'll be we'll be out of time. So quickly, when would you use chelates, and are some brands better than others? Uh, that's not something I could. I, 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 it, the none of the farms um, on the project of the fourteen farms, none were using collated minerals. Um, I'm not sure how much evidence there is out there in terms of the beneficial effects of um, collated minerals. There's, you know, as with lots of minerals, there's there's um, there is there's there's all sorts of claims. Um, so I didn't have any any um, involvement with, with the use of collated minerals, so I couldn't recommend um, you know any 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 brand over any other. I I, I certainly think that, you know that I would look at the basics first in terms of uh, the mineral contents within the diet and whether those are meeting requirement before I worried whether a mineral is collated or non collated. Thanks, Andrew. And our last question is, did you notice any difference in mineral status from the different sources of minerals, um, such as drench, bolus, premix, etc.? 
Uh, no, it's it's again. It's um, I mentioned that you should include um, injectables or boluses in terms of of, of conducting a mineral audit, um, but none of the farms on the project uh, were using um, a, a boluses, and nobody was using injectables. So that simplified things to some extent. But um, I, I I know that having done the um the project that some farms are now using boluses and some farms have altered their strategies and um, we obviously found a couple of farms that were, were, that were that weren't feeding any minerals at all um whilst the grass you know whilst animals were turned out and i mentioned that you know feeding minerals was a requirement on all farms so um it, it certainly altered behavior slightly but uh, but at the start of the project there were there was there was nothing um, nobody was using boluses, so it's it, that's again it's, it's, it's something I you know I couldn't really comment on. Thanks, Andrew. So we've we've come to the end of the questions. So thanks very much for answering those in um, nice and thoroughly, and, and thanks to everyone at home. We've had some interesting discussion tonight. Um, so the recording of the webinar will be emailed in the next day or two, should you want to recap, and um, it will be on the HDB Beef and Lamb YouTube channels. So thanks again, and have a good evening, everybody.